Hello, good morning to all of you. Today's lecture topic will be growth and development of the maxilla. I'm Dr. Yang. I hope you all are doing well today and can have a 100% focus of this lecture. Okay, for the learning outcome, at the end of the, this lecture, you should be able to define the terminologies of growth and apply the clinical application of growth and development in the functional appliance. I think these two learning outcomes for the terminologies and the clinical application have been explained in the previous lecture and I hope you understand this topic really well. And then the third one, you should be able to outline the methods of bone growth. And the fin finally, you need to know how to explain the prenatal and postnatal growth of the maxilla. So for this lecture, I will be focusing on the methods of bone growth and the prenatal and postnatal growth of maxilla. So for the mechanism of growth in heart tissue, the process of bone formation is called osteogenesis and then this bone, for bone formation takes place in two ways. Firstly is the endochondral bone formation and secondly the intramembranous bone formation. In this type of osteogenesis, the bone formation is preceded by formation of a cartilaginous model that is subsequently replaced by bone. Endochondral bone formation occurs as follows. Firstly, the cartilage cells undergo hypertrophy and then the matrix becomes calcified. Later, the cells degenerate and osteogenetic tissue invade this integrating cartilage and replace the cartilage by formation of bone. Endochondral bone formation occurs in regions exposed to high level of compression, for example, in areas like synchondrosis at the cranial base, condylar cartilage, and nasal septum cartilage. For the intramembranous bone formation, the formation of bone is not preceded by formation of a cartilaginous model. Instead, bone is laid down directly in a fibrous membrane. The intramembranous bone is formed in the following manner. Firstly, the undifferentiated mesenchymal cells will differentiate and become aggregated. Some of the mesenchymal cells lay down bundles of collagen fibers and then they will enlarge and form osteoblasts. These osteoblasts will secrete a gelatinous matrix called osteoid matrix around the collagen fibers. They deposit calcium salt into the osteoid leading to conversion of osteoid into bone lamella. Now the osteoblasts move away from the lamella and a new layer of osteoid is secreted which also get calcified. Some of the osteoblasts get entrapped between two lamella. They are called osteocyte. So if you want to see a better a picture of this intramembranous formation, you can look up in the Balaji, page 21. Okay, intramembranous bone formation occurs in areas exposed to tension. The formation of bone is directly from mesenchymal tissue and it is seen in the areas like cranial vault, maxilla, mandible, except condylar cartilage. For the mechanism of bone growth, there are five types of mechanism of bone growth uh, in human body, which is first one modeling, second remodeling, third displacement, fourth combination of remodeling and displacement, and finally rotation. In this lecture, I will explain more on the remodeling, displacement, and combination of remodeling and displacement because these three types of mechanism of bone growth is usually happen in neck, head and neck region. Okay, firstly, the remodeling. What is remodeling? Remodeling is a process involving deposition and resorption occurring on opposite ends. So when we see in this picture, okay, uh, the plus symbol 
shows that there is a progressively change the size of whole bone and then uh, the plus symbol meaning that the bone is deposited. However, the minus sign showing that the bone is resorbed. So once the bone deposition and bone resorption happen, it subsequently relocate each component of the whole bone. Okay, this picture shows how the surface remodeling occurs. When one side having a bone deposition and the other side having bone resorption and then the, mo the bone will move along the way. Okay, secondly is displacement. Displacement refers to a shift in the position of a bone. There is two types of displacement. Firstly is the primary displacement and secondly is the secondary displacement. So what is the difference between these two types of displacement? Primary displacement is a physical movement of a whole bone and occurs while the bone grows and remodels by resorption and deposition. For example, in the maxilla, meaning that the bone itself having uh, some bone deposition and some bone resorption and the bone itself move downward and forward. For example, in the maxilla, some part of the maxilla having bone deposition and some part having bone resorption. So, because of this surface remodeling, because of this primary displacement, the maxilla, the whole segment of the maxilla will move downward and forward. Secondly, is the secondary displacement. It's a movement of the whole bone caused by a separate enlargement of other bone. For example, okay, we can see for example in the maxilla also, for example, the bone, depo uh, the bone deposition and the bone resorption happens in the fragment of bone besides maxilla. So because of this fragment of bone having bone deposition and bone resorption, and then the maxilla will also will move due to the effect of the deposition and resorption of the nearby bone that is called secondary displacement meaning that uh, the resorption and deposition from the nearby bone causing that the whole fragment of the maxilla to be moved okay in this table is showing more explanation about the primary and secondary displacement now we will focus on the primary displacement Primary displacement means that there is a movement of the bone as the bone enlarge itself. And then the movement can be either in the direction of bone deposition or in the direction of bone resorption. As the bone enlarge, it is carried away from other bone. Growth remodeling takes place to maintain contact. For example, condyles grows upward and backward to maintain contact with fossa as the mandible is displaced downward. Similarly, maxilla is displaced downward and forwards to maintain the contact bone deposition takes place in upward and backward direction. So for the secondary displacement, the movement of the whole bone caused by the enlargement of the other bone, usually the nearby bone, which are present nearby and quite distant, and it is called secondary displacement. Increase in size of the medial cranial fossa can cause the maxilla to be displaced anteriorly and inferiorly. This is independent of the growth and enlargement of the maxilla itself. Sometimes, you will also see a combination of remodeling and displacement. Both of these mechanisms operate together and cause enlargement and movement of the bone. Now we will move into prenatal growth of the maxilla. For the prenatal growth, around the fourth wave of intrauterine life, a prominent bulge appears on the ventral aspect of the embryo corresponding to the developing brain. Below the bulge, there is a shallow depression which corresponds to the primitive mouth appear called stomodium. The floor of the stomodium is formed by the bacopharyngeal membrane that separates the stomodium from the foregut.
By around the fourth week of intrauterine life, five brachial arches form in the region of the future head and neck. Each of these arches give rise to muscle, connective tissue, vasculature, skeletal component, and neural component of the future face. Now we will look at this photo. We can see that the first backbreaker arch is called the mandibular arch and it plays an important role in the development of the nasomaxillary region and then the mesoderm covering the developing forebrain proliferates and form a downward projection that overlaps the upper part of stomodium. This downward projection is called frontonasal process. The stomodium is thus overlapped superiorly by, by the frontonasal process. The mandibular arches of both of sides from the lateral wall of the stomodium. The mandibular arch give off a bud from its dorsal and called the maxillary process. The maxillary process grows ventromediocranial to the main part of the mandibular arch that is now called the mandibular process. Thus, at this stage, the primitive mouth of stomodium is overlapped from above by the frontal process, below by the mandibular process, and on either side by the maxillary process. As a recap for prenatal embryology, the upper third of face is formed by the frontonasal process, the middle third of face is formed by the maxillary process, and lower third of face is formed by the mandibular process. The ectoderm overlying the frontonasal process show bilateral localized thickening above the stomodium. So we can see that in this photo, uh, the thickening is in blue color. This is called the nasal placodes. These placodes soon sink and form the nasal pit. The formation of this nasal pit divides the frontonasal process into two parts. The first one is the medial nasal process and the secondly is the lateral nasal process. Okay, this photo shows uh, the image of the prenatal development of the maxilla and the face. The red color is the frontonasal process. The blue color is the medial nasal process. The green color is mandibular process and the yellow color is the lateral nasal process. The two mandibular process will grow medially and fuse to form the lower lip and lower jaw. As the maxillary process undergoes growth, the frontonasal process becomes narrow so that the two nasal pits become closer. The line of fusion of the maxillary process and the medial nasal process correspond to the nasolacrimal duct. At the seven weeks of intrauterine life, uh, there will be a formation of the upper lip and then the intramembranous bone ossification takes place and then it will be followed by the formation of the nasal septum, nasolacrimal duct and also the formation of the primary palate. At the eight weeks intrauterine life, Two intermaxillary ossification centers generate the alveolar ridge and primary palate. The intramembranous ossification centers appear for nasal and recrimal bone, medial pterygoid plate of sphenoid, vomer, and zygomatic bone. At the 28th days of intrauterine life, there will be a disintegration of bulcopharyngeal membrane. And this stomadial chamber will give rise to oral cavity and nasal cavity. For the palate formation, basically there will be a horizontal extension which consists of two secondary palatal shafts 
and one single primary pallet. There are three important stages in the pallet formation, which is the formation of primary and secondary pallet. Secondly, the elevation of palletal shaft. And finally, the fusion of the palletal shaft. Now, I would like to explain what is the primary, primary pallet and what is the secondary pallet. The primary pallet develops at the same time as the external phase, which is around 5th and 6th weeks. The maxillary process undergo extensive growth, first coming into contact with the lateral nasal process, and secondly with the globular process of the merged median nasal for, uh, process or philtrum. Initially, the medial nasal and lateral nasal process come into contact and secondarily, the medial nasal and maxillary process come together just below and in front of the contact site between the medial and lateral nasal process and they will pinch some epithelium between them. This sheet of epithelium is composed of future nasal epithelium superiorly and future oral epithelium inferiorly. The two layers of epithelium are then pulled apart, making the mesenchyme between the medial nasal and maxillary process continuous. This is what we call the core of primary palate. For the secondary palate, the posterior border of the primary palate is located just posterior to the side of the future incisive foramen of the skull. As the face grows in an anterior posterior dimension, the primary palate soon is too short to provide adequate separation between the nasal cavities and the oral cavity. A new structure, the secondary palate, developed to further separate these cavities. During the 7 and 8 weeks, the middle wall of the maxillary process produces a pair of thin medial extension, which is called palatal process. Initially, these grow predominantly vertically downward and parallel to the lateral surface of the tongue. By the beginning of the 8 weeks, however, the tongue begins to contract and move out of the way in addition. The lower jaw drops as it grows downward and forward. By the end of 8 weeks, the palatal process rotates rapidly upward to a horizontal position and fuses with each other and with the primary palate. The fused palatal process form the secondary palate and together with the primary palate, they form the definitive palate. So now, when will the elevation of the palatal shaft occur? It occurs around 6 to 8 weeks where the tongue pushes dorsally and the palatal shaft becomes vertical. Elevation occurs from horizontal to vertical po position. And then this diagram shows the movement of the palatal shaft and tongue during palate closure. Uh, the tongue will move anteriorly and will depress downward and laterally as the palatal shaft slide from B to A over the tongue. This photo shows the fusion of the palatal shaft. The palatal shaft began to fuse ventrodosally with each other, the primary palate and the inferior border of the nasal septum around 9 weeks. So what is the clinical significance of the formation of the palate? Any disturbance in the timing and the process of the palatal shaft elevation from a vertical to a horizontal orientation and the subsequent fusion is likely to cause clefting. So you need to know when is the timing of the primary palate formation and when is the timing of the secondary palate formation. So for the primary palate formation, the timing is around 28 to 38 days and then the secondary palate formation, the timing is from 42 to 55 days.
Now we will move into the postnatal growth of the maxilla. The maxilla develop postnatally entirely by intramembranous ossification. Since there is no cartilage replacement, growth occurs by three ways. Firstly, the displacement. Secondly, growth at sutures. And thirdly, the surface remodeling. The growth pattern of the maxilla requires that it grows out from under the cranium, which means that the maxilla must move downward and forward. The sutures attaching the maxilla posteriorly and superiorly are ideally situated to allow its downward and forward repositioning. This photo shows the sutures are all oblique and more or less parallel to each other. This allows the downward and forward repositioning of maxilla as growth occur at the sutures. Now, this slide shows where the bone displays during the growth at the suture. For up and down movement of the bone during the growth is happening at the where the growth happen at the frontozygomatic sutures, frontonasal sutures, and bone deposition along the alveolar margin. So displacement of the bone forward and backward happens when the growth happening at nasomaxillary suture and temporozygomatic suture. When the bone is displaced, uh upward and backward is when the growth at the suture uh, of zygomatico maxillary and the mid parietal suture as the downward and forward movement occurs the space that will otherwise open up at the sutures is filled in by the proliferation of bone at this location maxilla attached to cranial base by suture therefore Growth of the cranial is at the same rate of growth of the maxilla. This is what we call secondary displacement. The suture remains the same width and the various process of the maxilla becomes longer. The bone apposition occurs on both sides of suture so the bones to which the maxilla is attached also become larger. Part of the posterior border of the maxilla is a free surface in the tuberosity region. Bone is added at this surface, creating additional space into which the primary and then the permanent molatis successively erupt. The whole of the maxilla undergoes simultaneously process of primary displacement in an anterior and inferior direction as it grows and lengthens posteriorly. As the maxilla grows downward and forward, its front surface are remodeled and the bone is removed from most of the anterior surface. This photo shows that the maxilla is like the platform on wheels being rolled forward while at the same time its surface represented by the wall is being reduced on its anterior side and built up posteriorly, moving in space opposite to the direction of overall growth. Now we will look into surface remodeling. Resorption occurs on lateral surface of the orbital rim leading to lateral movement of eyeball. To compensate this, there is bone deposition on medial rim of orbit and external surface of lateral rim. Surface deposition occur in superior, lateral and anterior direction resulting in growth. Zygomatic bone move in posterior direction by resorption of anterior surface and deposition on posterior surface. Face enlarged in width by bone formation of lateral surface of zygomatic arch and resorption on medial surface. Bone resorption occurs on floor of nasal cavity and bone deposition on palatal side. This will result in net downward shift and increase in maxillary height. Anterior nasal spine prominence increases due to bone deposition. 
Also, there is resorption on periosteal surface of labial cortex and deposition of endosteal surface of labial cortex and periosteal surface of lingual cortex. So, you can look at the diagram and look at A, B, C and D according to the explanation. As the teeth erupt, the bone deposition occurs at alveolar margin and increasing maxillary height and depth of the palate. So, what is the clinical significance of knowing all about the growth? The growth in width of the dental arch anterior to the first molar will cease by 5 to 6 years old. And then, the intercanal width will complete around 12 years old in female and 18 years old in males. And the mid palatine sutures start closing around 9 to 10 years of age. This means that the expansion of the palate best done between 9 to 14 years old. So now about the safety valve mechanism. Safety valve mechanism is the nature's attempt to maintain a proper occlusion. The maxillary intercanal width serves as a safety valve to compensate for the horizontal growth in mandible. In the mandible, intercanal width is completed at 9 years of age in girls and boys at 10 years of age. In the maxilla, intercanal width is completed by 12 years in girls and 18 years in boys. The delay in growth of the maxillary intercanal width serves as a safety valve for the pubertal growth spurt in the mandible. There is no equal amount of horizontal growth in the maxilla while the mandible grows horizontally. Maxillary intercanal width adjusts to the mandibular dentition and is brought forward. This is called safety valve mechanism. The sequence of safety valve mechanism is explained by the following flow chart. So this diagram shows that the intercanal width of the maxilla and the mandible. For the mandible, it completes by 9 years in female and completes by 10 years in males. And then it will be followed by the pubertal growth spurt and then there will be an increase in horizontal mandibular growth. After that, there will be an adjustment of maxillary intercanal width to maxillary dentition. Then only it will have will maintain proper occlusion. When we look at the maxilla, the intercanal width of the maxilla will complete by 12 years in female and 18 years in male. They will also show there is a delay. Delay in the maxillary intercanal width serve as safety valve. So both in the maxilla and the mandible intercanal width will maintain a proper occlusion. So, uh, at the end of the lecture, you should ask yourself, can you define the terminologies of growth? Can you apply the clinical application of growth and development in functional appliance? These two learning outcomes uh, you can get from the previous lecture. And then for this lecture, you should ask yourself, would you able to outline the methods of bone growth? And then can you explain briefly about the prenatal and postnatal growth of the maxilla? So I hope you you will try to understand this topic. Growth topic is quite hard to understand because uh, it's very dull topic. I understand that. I've been through all what you all been through now. So I hope you can read the textbook, the Balaji, because I think this is the this is your main reference of this topic, and you will and there is a lot of facts inside this textbook. I wish you all the best and then I hope uh, uh, you can understand more after reading the textbook and after my lecture. Thank you so much and have a nice day.